Hello, Itisi. Is it Itisi? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we couldn't figure out if it was Itisi or Itisi. Uh, my name is Vanessa. My handle is Mozzadrella. I am the director of GitHub Education, and I could not be happier to join you all with the perspectives of two educators who I really emphatically admire, Mina and Shane. Dr. Shane Wilson is lecturer at Ulster University and a fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy. I learned about Shane's work when he applied to be part of our teacher program, Campus Advisors, and his work on delivering feedback via automated assessment uh, has really tra directly translated to student success. And Ulster recognized him, and this is the part where I'm gonna embarrass him. Uh, Ulster recognized him with several words. He won a Faculty of Engineering Excellence Award in Teaching in 2017, and a Distinguished Excellence Teaching Award in 2019, and this year won uh, Educator of the Year within his faculty and also inspirational lecturer of the year. So you're gonna, y'all are gonna have a great talk, I promise. He, he's obviously very good at this. Uh, when not serving students in academia, he's also had a career in industry, leading technical teams at Microsoft Ireland, including for Microsoft Office. His consulting partners include Intel, IBM, and Carphone Warehouse. Please welcome Shane. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I'm slightly embarrassed um, and under pressure now to deliver. Um, Vanessa, thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak today at this conference about GitHub Classroom and the work that I've done over the last year. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and share some of uh, what I've done and what's worked in using GitHub and GitHub Classroom with my own students. So if you'll indulge me, so University of Ulster, multi-campus university, 26,000 students. I'm in the School of Computing, Engineering, and Intelligent Systems in the Miki campus in Derry, which is 400 kilometers this way, I think. Um, so we have a bunch of students, and if you'll indulge me in a little bit of Jack and Ori to set some context, uh, a reference there for anyone from the UK and Ireland. About three years ago, I had a great idea. I went to my head of department and I asked if I could teach one of those programming modules that we have on many of our courses. And she thought it was a great idea. And she said, there you go, there's a bunch of students. I thought they were all going to be enthusiastic and I was going to have a nice small class. But no, I had 165 students and they were more like this. And we've all seen this. As educators, we've all seen this. So I was kind of going, okay, teaching programming is going to be difficult. These are different students. You know, my next thought was, what have I done? Really, have I bitten off more than I can chew here? Because programming and teaching programming is difficult. We all love programming. Those of us who teach programming love programming. We, we enjoy teaching it because we enjoy programming ourselves. But for students, it can be really challenging. The issues of engagement, getting students to engage and participate can be quite challenging. And also, they tend to adopt, if you let them, this voodoo style of programming where they'll tap away on the keyboard happily. They'll compile it. If it runs, it might actually work and do what's requested. And if it doesn't, they'll go again. So there's this whole style of programming that you've got to shake them out of. They don't read textbooks. You're lucky if they look at the compiler errors. So we've got this YouTube generation of students who diametrically put different mindsets to what we're used to. But we've got these pressures as well of employability and student attainment and progress. And we've got to ensure that we're teaching them employable skills, skills that are going to get them a job, because 99% of these kids are here to get a job in industry, not to do PhDs and things like that. So when you've got a large bunch of students, the assessment is a real issue. Now, we can use multiple choice class tests and Blackboard, but I really wanted to assess my students' programming ability. And that's difficult when you've got 165, 200 students. So I spent some time thinking about what I could do and I did a bunch of whole different things. I flipped my classroom, I got rid of lectures, I created 17 hours of instructional videos, and I started using technology carefully and also to leverage the benefits of it. So a lot of the technologies I use, and the key ones over the last couple of years have been GitHub, Travis Continuous Integration, GitHub Classroom. I use Git Kraken as the preferred client for students to commit code to GitHub. And then the module I have that I did all of this was object-oriented programming with C++, a year two module, with around 165 students. It's fluctuated a little bit. So the preferred IDE that we use is Visual Studio, but I let the kids use anything that they actually want. 
So I focus on problem-based learning, project-based learning in the classrooms. So each of the class starts off with an outline problem. Usually it takes 10 to 15 minutes, small little chunks of problems so we get the students to tackle. I pair them up, they undertake those, they commit their solution to a Git repo, they use a Discord chat server then to post a link to the repository. And then I'll randomly pick three or four, I'll review the student's code, I'll highlight it in class, I'll go through what's good, what's bad, what can be improved, the wee gems that the students have. And I'll add comments on those as well, and also I'll release my own solution through Git, which is fantastic. And over the course of 12 weeks, all of these little bits of code that students are committing to their own repositories for each of the exercises during the week actually contribute to this library of resources that other students can use and they can comment on. And my students have found that tremendously helpful. So in the Discord chat server, a student asks, where can I find a bit of code to validate an email address? And someone will say, week three, lab six, there's a repo for it, here's the example, here's some comments as well. So that's tremendously useful. But again, with a large classroom, the problem is assessment. How do we conduct meaningful assessment? 165 students, we want them to do programming assignments. We want to test the ability to write code using industry standard tools um, and technologies and workflows and prepare them for jobs within industry. And for me, Blackboard tests don't do that. They have their place, but I don't think they for really the best way of doing it. So what I've done is the students write the code in C++, then they commit their assignments to GitHub, they can push it up using Visual Studio, command line, any way that they want. Now what happens is that whenever they commit their code to their repository for their assignment, Travis continuous, continuous integration system spins up a Linux virtual machine, it clones the student repository, pulls in some unit tests, will run those, compile the code and run those unit tests against the student's code. And the unit tests are written such as that it'll test discrete bits of functionality and where the test passed, the students get marks and they'll get feedback. If it fails, they'll get a nudge and a hint as to why it has failed and what part of the code that they should look at. And they get this feedback within three or four minutes of submitting their code to the repo. And I let them commit as many times as they want, again and again and again. So each time they're committing, they're getting feedback within three or four minutes. And this scales to 10 students, to 200 students, to 500 students. So in order to do this, it's actually quite simple, but there are roughly about five steps. First thing you need to do is you need to sign up for GitHub Education. So you need to get your students to sign up to GitHub Education. They get a load of resources, they get a developer pack, you have to sign up as well. And there's a couple of programs that you can undertake then as well. The student can undertake the Campus Experts. One of my students recently undertook took that and completed it. It's a great program, it's not just about GitHub, and using Git is about leadership skills and employability skills as well. So it's tremendously beneficial for students. Once you've signed up and been approved, you can go into the GitHub Classroom, and I recommend that you undertake the excellent GitHub Campus Advisor training as well, which is designed specifically for us. So once you've got your GitHub account and it's, it's been approved as educator, you then essentially have an enterprise account, if I'm correct, and you have an unlimited number of private repositories. Once you've done that, you can sign up into GitHub Classroom. Once you've done that, then you need to create an organization. So an organization in GitHub Classroom is essentially a group of people working together as a company, it could be an open source project, but essentially where you're going to host, in essence, classrooms for uh, your particular course, whether it's object oriented programming, programming one, or Java one, or whatever it is. So the steps are actually quite simple. You just have to log into your account, go over to the settings for your account, and then into organizations, and then just create a new organization. It's actually dead simple. You just give it a snazzy name, a meaningful name. So I just use the course codes, a personal account. Initially, you'll just set zero, and then you can upgrade your uh, organization then later on. So you just add in some basic information, how many students you're gonna have, and that's it. You've got your organization. So at that point, you can upgrade your organization to avail of the enterprise subscription. You have an unlimited number of private repositories that you can create. So once you've got your organization, then you can create your classrooms for each of the courses or modules that you're teaching, programming one, programming two, so on and so forth. And all you have to do is just log into GitHub Classroom. You just create a new classroom. You need to grant access um, for the organization. So for that organization, you need to grant access for GitHub Classroom. And I always forget my password, so 
for, sorry about that delay. So once you validate your password, you've just got to approve it. So a quick refresh, and then you grant access. Fine. So again, you give it a snazzy title. Now I find it useful for each of the classrooms to name, put them by the year that you're actually teaching as well, because you can have multiple classrooms over a number of different years. So you can add administrators. You can add a roster for your students, which I didn't do, which you should do. I will do the next time around. And that's your classroom created. Now, so once you've got your classroom, you can create a number of assignments for your students hosted on GitHub Classroom. But what you want to do first is essentially create a skeleton assignment. So this is going to be skeleton code that you give your students. So what I'll do is I'll just exit out of this, and I'll go across to my skeleton code. So this is it. So this is object-oriented programming with C++. This was the first assignment that I gave the students. They just had to create a date class. Something simple. They could create a date object. They could have put a, initialize it with strings, and so on and so forth. So this is essentially what they're going to get whenever they accept the assignment. So they've got a readme file with the usual information. When they've got to submit the problem statement, what they've got to do, the files they can work on and should not modify within the repo. So you want to ensure that you are upfront and tell them these are the files that they can modify and should modify. There's other ones they shouldn't touch. They're going to break things. Or I thought as well, some students might try and rig the system and change the unit test so they could get 100%. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Any constraints, exceptions, notes, and here was the marking scheme for the students. So there's marks for each of the unit tests that would be run against the student submissions. So that's just a readme file, straightforward readme file. And we've got a bunch of other stuff in here. Assignment one folder is just the Visual Studio solution and project. Uh, so that's just your straightforward boilerplate code, some instructions as to what they have to do. So again, this could be C++, C, Java, Python, supports a variety of different languages. Uh, the, we've got the Google test uh, submodule in here. We've got the unit test. We'll look at those in a minute. But here's the Travis YML file. So this is a file that allows you to configure exactly the type of uh, virtual machine that's going to be spun up in Travis. So here I'm just specifying that I want to install C17 um, and the unit tests that I want to run and the make files that are going to be executed. So it's not terribly complicated. It takes a little bit of time reading through the documentation. But if I can do it, I'm sure anyone else here can do it. And then we have the CMake list. So here we're specifying the source code that's going to get compiled. It's just a regular CMake the unit tests that are going to be executed. One thing to note that I didn't expect was, because this is using GCC, uh, you can use CLang if you want, and the students were using uh, Microsoft Visual Studio in the classroom, the compiler warnings uh, by default can be different. And that can throw them when they're used to using Visual Studio, and then they move to GCC. So you just want to be wary of that. In terms of the unit tests, it's just one file with all the unit tests bundled in here. Make that a little bit larger. So they're just arranged fairly simply in a AAA format. So we have a range. So we're arranging the data. We've got the act, so the thing that's been tested, and we're just doing an assert. So if that assert is true, then we're going to award them some points. We're going to give them a little bit of feedback. And if it fails, we're going to give them, say, your test has failed, and a little nudge as to why it has failed. And you can put whatever you want in here in terms of the feedback. You can be as descriptive and as complete, or you can be a little bit vague. So they have to work a little bit to actually figure out what's actually going on and why the unit tests are failing. So once you've created your skeleton code, you can then use that to create the skeleton assignment. So you've got that. So you can create your assignment now within GitHub Classroom. So I'll walk you through that. So there we go. So you can create individual assignments, group assignments. They both work exactly the same way. You give your assignment a title. Again, column 329, assignment 1, whatever you want. And whatever you type in there is going to be a prefix for each of the repositories for the students when they create their own private repository or accept the assignment. You want to make it private, because you don't want your students being able to share and see each other's assignments. You don't want to give them admin access, generally. 
you do want to use an invitation URL because that's a URL that you'll send out to students that they will then click on to accept the assignment. And you just set a submission deadline as you normally would. That's it, pretty much. Bing. So there's the URL that you can now issue to the students. And every time they click on that URL or the first time, it will create a private repository for them and it will clone that skeleton code. So when they go in, there's the starter code for them. You can give them as much and as little as you want. So the other thing that you need to do is you need to give access, continuous integration platform access to your organization as well. So you just have to log into your settings and give Travis CI uh, third party access to your GitHub organization. And once that's done, whenever uh, those repositories are, are committed by the students, Travis will spin up and uh, run the unit tests. From a student's perspective, it's dead easy. They just have to accept the assignment by clicking on the assignment link. I found that it works best in Chrome. Sometimes you have issues with Internet Explorer. So they just paste in the URL or click on it from a Word doc or a PDF, whatever you've issued it. They get this message saying, do you want to accept the assignment? And whenever they accept the assignment, then GitHub is going to go off. It's going to create a private repository for that student or that group of students. And it's going to clone your starter code and put it into their private repository. Okay, they're ready to go. They can start working on their code. They can clone the code down to their local machine. They can start working away, and that's what they get. So they've got all of the instructions in there, in the repo, which is really good. And they can just click through the code and look at the code, and they can start working from there. So now imagine that the students have actually gone, they've worked on their assignment, they've, they've got a, a version that they want to commit, so all they have to do is just commit it as they do from the IDE, from Git Kraken, or from the command line, whatever they want. And then they just jump over into Travis CI, log in, and they can look at the results. So I'll just show you that now. Okay, so in Travis CI, they can look at each of the repos that have been parsed up and cloned by Travis CI and the unit tests executed against. They can look at each of the builds. So every time there's a commit, Travis CI is going to spin up. They can cancel that uh, if they want um, and not run the unit test, or they can run through it and see the unit test. So that's just the initialization of Travis CI. And the stuff in green is the stuff that's really interesting that we'll focus in on. These are the unit tests being run. And for each of those unit tests, you're giving the students feedback. And this is happening within three to four minutes of the students committing to the repository. So in a group of 165 students, the students are getting feedback continuously as much or as a little that you actually want to put into the, the unit tests along with each of the unit tests, the descriptions of when it fails and when it passes and nudges as to that. So there we go, getting a mark automatically for those unit tests executed against the student's submission. Now, I did this last year and the results for me were pretty impressive. So uh, I, I started the module in 2017, and we've seen a gradual increase in student attainment over that period of time. We're getting students that are consistently getting higher marks on their programming, and we're assessing their actual ability to program, not to answer multiple choice class tests. And this is C++, remember, it's not Python, which perceived to be easier, whether it is or not, or Java. This is one of those harder languages that we tend to be afraid of, and um, it's challenging for the students to learn, and it's challenging for us to teach. Also, progression has been great. This is the first year I've managed to get just over 90% progression. And this is in a module of over 150 students. That, that's pretty cool, really. I'm really happy about that. And, and so are uh, my bosses within the Ulster University as well, naturally enough. One of the things I wasn't expecting about was the students would commit so many times. Now, I wouldn't read too much into this. So here we've got the number of commits and the average mark across the students for the assignment. Now, is it possible for students to get marks by attrition by continually to submit and get feedback? Yes. And so I had some students that were getting 100%. And that caused a bit of a hobble, uh, hullabaloo. Um, if it was a math exam or assignment and a student got 100%, would it be an issue? In industry, they're going to be working for companies such as CETA and Microsoft. They're going to be writing code that's going to be unit tested to see if it works or not. And the assignments, these assignments were designed so that they can't get the answers through trial and error. They have to look at the assignment, they have to look at the feedback, they have to look at the error messages and figure out what's wrong and go from there. So if a student is learning in between each of the commits, I think that's a win. 
And if they are getting 100% and they know their stuff, they know how it works, I think I'm, I'm fine with that, it's good. But as well, not all of these commits were actually feedback loops for the students. Sometimes, and quite a, the better students were using GitHub all the time. They were working collaboratively in their projects. They were making incremental changes to their code. They were knew it wasn't production ready, so they weren't running the Travis CI, so they were canceling that, and they were using it as they should use Git and GitHub, which is fantastic. The big win for me was the amount of time that I saved in terms of marking. Now, two years ago, I spent easily six to eight weeks. It just felt forever, half the module just marking, just continuously marking. And this is a ballpark figure of the amount of hours I spent just marking. Now, we have to do all of the admin and our teaching and our project supervision and our research and our consultancy on top of this. So two years ago, I was spending six to eight weeks. This year, I spent maybe a week at most marking all the student assignments. And most of that time was spent ensuring the students didn't cheat, so as comparing repositories against other repositories, making sure they didn't modify the unit tests. And even though I taught the students how to write unit tests, I was amazed not one of the students modified the unit tests to give themselves 100%. I was quite amazed by that surprise, but they didn't. Um, I'd warned them quite sternly. So most of this time was actually just the regular administrative duties of filling in spreadsheets, putting in marks, issuing feedback through Blackboard, and so on and so forth, and just doing, dotting the I's and the T, crossing the T's that we normally have to do as well. So it saved me an enormous amount of time. Other benefits, when we have group assignments and we have students who are saying, hey, I did much more of the assignment than this guy did, I should get more of the marks. In GitHub, you can go into the repository and you can see exactly how much each student contributed. You can also see when they started the assignment and how long they've been working on it. Did that a student or that group of students submit a solution the day the assignment was due that was fully working? If they did, that's a red flag. If they just iteratively worked on the assignment over a couple of weeks and gradually got better and you can see they were all contributing fantastic. And if you had a student who's claiming that they did a lot of work and you can dig in and see that actually they only committed maybe three times and only added 20 or 30 lines of code. So it resolves all those issues sometimes, especially in group assignments where students are saying they did much more work than they actually did. That was pretty cool. Also GitHub issues. So you've got a platform as well within GitHub to actually feed back to the students and for students to collab collaborate and make suggestions and comment on each other's code. And it's all recorded there. So you can help students out. They can tag you. They can say, this isn't working. Do you mind having a look? And you can jump in and explain it to them. So the issues were really powerful. One of the things I didn't use that I should have used was the project boards. So there's all of these project management tools that you can use within that as well to help students manage their own projects and they're adopting modern workflow and best practices in software engineering, which is great. And these are, it's all about employability. And for me, in summary, huge saving was the automated feedback uh, marking. Students love that. In terms of module feedback, uh, my uh, scale of uh, strongly agree to agree, uh, just over 90% of the students strongly agreed uh, and the module delivery was excellent and the comments and feedback from the student was fantastic. We really enjoyed that. Um, reduced time in marking. You know, I saved 50 plus hours that I could dedicate to other things, project supervision, helping students, teaching, research. So it's given me a huge amount of my life back. Uh, and you all know the burden of marking, I'm sure. Improved learner outcomes. Students got better. They got better marks on average. And the module moved from multiple choice Blackboard Cloud tests um, to actual programming assignments, which I thought was great and enhance employability. When students, these students are year two students, they do an internship for the full third year, and during my module, they're being interviewed by employers. And for these students to be able to turn up to an interview and saying, yeah, I'm doing C++, using Visual Studio, but I'm also using version control, I'm using Git, I'm using GitHub, I'm using continuous integration and deployment technologies as well. They are employability skills, hugely beneficial for these students who are trying to get jobs within the industry for industrial placements and internships. So it was a big one for them. On the downside is a little bit of front loaded preparation that's required. You've got to write the skeleton assignment, you've got to write the solution. Um, and once that's done, life gets way easier then. So you can do those things over the summer. The students need to learn Git for this, but also they need to learn Git. 
you know, they need to learn modern software engineering tools and technologies. So you need to carve out time at the start of the module, the start of the year, to teach them these fundamentals. And there's great resources online. Um, GitHub Education have tremendous resources. There's also an education swag pack that you can get if you contact GitHub and Education Forum. And GitHub sent me this huge 20 kilo box full of printed manuals and guides and t-shirt codes and tons of stickers and students love stickers and love free t-shirts. So thank you again for that pack. So you definitely want to do that. And also compiler differences. Sometimes that can trip them out. So if you're using Travis CI, it's GCC or CLang, and if you're using something else in the classroom, you need to make the students aware of that. But we're trying to develop students that can transition from one tool and technology and platform to another. So that's also good for them. So thank you very much. I know we don't have time for questions, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have either via email or over in the GitHub stand after this talk. So thank you very much. High five. Great job. <laughs> well, Mina is getting set up here. Dr. Mina Chetankaya Rundell is senior lecturer at the School of Mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. Her work focuses on innovation in statistics and data science pedagogy with an emphasis on computation and reproducible research. Uh, she's moved from Duke to the University of Edinburgh to uh, she'll be developing data science courses to train the Scottish workforce, which is pretty cool. And she and I have been working together for a few years. And something I really admire about her is that she's very committed to having students learn with free uh, open source tools that they can actually grow with, that they can take to industry. And it doesn't cost them an arm and a leg. Uh, if they want to start their own thing, um, they're definitely prepared. And I think that will resonate with a lot of folks here. Um, you're involved in a million open source projects, one of a, a huge uh, MOOC on Coursera, and in 2016, you received the American Statistical Association's Waller's Education Award. Awesome. Uh, and uh, I just couldn't be more excited to have her here. It's really exciting to have a statistician at a computer science conference. Uh, please welcome Mina. All right, thank you very much. Um, this is, you, you know, Coming to a computer science conference as a statistician should be the dictionary definition of imposter syndrome. But here we are. So today I want to talk about R and GitHub sitting in a Git tree. <laughs> um, so I use R and, and I teach R. I live and breathe R. And actually one of my, um, kind of one of the things that I decided when I tra transitioned my teaching from being more kind of hand calculations, which is what traditionally introductory statistics has been like, to more computational and data science focused is that I am going to use a toolkit that I teach my students. I will live it, I will breathe it, and I will use it for trying to solve all of the course problems so I can actually encounter issues myself and learn along the way so I never forget how painful it is to learn a new language. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about how my course is structured in the context of uh, teaching introductory data science and then some of the tooling that I've been working on to make the teaching easier for me and hopefully more enjoyable for the students as well. So let's start with the context here. So I teach an introductory data science course and students coming into this course have little to no background in computing data science or statistics but I at least expect and I tell them that they should have some enthusiasm to learn, that this is not going to be something where they're not going to hit roadblocks. In fact, there are well curated roadblocks along the way in the class and that we expect them to read documentation along the way, but that will help them as well. And the goal is that they leave this course ready to tackle real life data science problems using modern computational tools. Um, there's a variety of ways of doing data analysis. Not all of it necessarily involves modern computation. And we might disagree on our definition of modern computation as well. But I at least want the students to be aware of what they're learning and where that kind of sits in the great grander scheme of the types of things employers or graduate schools are looking for in terms of uh, students coming in. 
So this is what the roadmap for the class looks like. There are three major units in the class, exploring data, making rigorous conclusions, and looking forward. That's kind of the last bit at the end. So we actually start by doing fundamentals of data and data visualization. So unlike many of the computer science curricula that I have encountered, or even data science curricula that are developed not by statisticians necessarily, the first thing we do is data visualization. And we use that as the tool to teach programming as well. So again, these students don't come in knowing R, but they start learning R. What is a function? What is a data frame? What is a vector in the context of data visualization? We also use this data visualization as an opportunity to teach them a little bit of statistics as well. So things like confounding variables and Simpson's paradox that can be highly difficult to wrap your head around, but can be displayed very nicely with visualization. Um, then we move on to doing some data wrangling. So we talk about what is a tidy data frame? What are data frames of observations collected from individuals versus summary statistics, which are two different things that might look very similar in tabular form, but the way you would approach them in terms of mod modeling would be very different. Um, recoding and transforming. And then here we also start talking about how to get data. So one of them is obviously, sure, you could post a survey and people could respond to it. But another very common way of getting data in this day and age is web scraping. And this is the bit where we start actually introducing them more programming concepts like iteration. I used to teach students iteration in the context of bootstrap sampling, where you do something over and over again. But something I realized along the way is that already resampling is a conceptually difficult thing to do. And it requires a little bit of appreciation of the statistics behind it. However, seeing a web page and saying, I want to get the data from there into my computer, and I want to do it for the next page, and the next page, and the next page, is actually potentially easier to wrap your head around, because you really can check to see whether your code worked, because if so, you have the data in front of your eyes. Um, and it doesn't involve any sort of randomness that would come up in bootstrapping. So they learn about iteration. And then in the next unit, where we actually do a little bit more statistics, so we do modeling and statistical inference from the um, perspective of it, uh, simulations, they're doing this, the, applying the same iteration skills that they've learned in a computing context, but doing so for random sampling. So they are doing model building, uh, visualizing interactions, a little bit of prediction and validation where we touch upon things that might allude to machine learning and tell them you might want to learn about them more. Um, and then we also do some statistical inference via simulation, mostly focusing on bootstrap confidence intervals. And I will get back to why I emphasize that in a second in terms of the types of work that we're assessing from the students. At the end of the class, the students are working on a project uh, on a data set of their own choosing. And I want to give them a little bit of a room to breathe at that point and not give them additional kind of weekly homework assignments for the last two weeks. So instead, what we do is we do these modules where there's not necessarily a homework for them, just in-class activities. Um, and I change them around from semester to semester. Um, data science ethics is something that is weaved throughout the class, but we actually devote one particular lecture to it in terms of talking about things like algorithmic bias. Uh, not something they're implementing, but I think something they should be exposed to before they can say, I had a semester's worth of data science. Uh, we do a little bit of interactive visualization and reporting. Uh, some text analysis. I didn't really know much text analysis, so I figured I'll put it on the syllabus and learn about it. And students seem to really like it. Um, and we kind of ended on something um, about decision making and different ways of making decisions and Bayesian inference um, in a dichotomous setting. But we throughout the whole course are four um, very important topics that we actually make time for during class. Modern computing, reproducibility, collaboration, and communication. So we're actually carving out class time for students to do all of these throughout each of these units. That does mean that perhaps we don't get to cover as much as we would, but I do strongly believe that if you're going to be introducing a new technology or have the expectation of proper communication of results, you need to make time for students to actually get to practice that in the classroom as well. So. In terms of the context, these are uh, three courses where I've implemented the, that follow the same uh, curriculum. The two of them I've taught at Duke, and the next one I'll be teaching at University of Edinburgh uh, in the fall. 
I have no idea what's waiting for me at this point. Um, so the, initially I started this curriculum with a first year undergraduate seminar with only 18 students. And 18 is just the kind of the point where you're thinking, I don't need to automate anything. I can click my way through things and get through it. Um, then I started teaching it to a wider audience. Uh, we had about 100 students. Uh, the course was open to all, although we targeted first and second years. And I realized certain things we're doing in terms of the infrastructure of the course need to be automated, otherwise I will lose my mind. Um, and at University of Edinburgh, we are capping the course at 100 for the first year, so I can understand how the uh, UK system works. <laughs> but the plan is to be able to open it up to a, a much bigger audience. So these issues of scalability are definitely creeping up and are making me reconsider some of the decisions I've made in the curriculum, in ter especially in terms of assessment. So what does the infrastructure of the course look like? And in the slides, I'm going to use this legend in the top um, corner where sometimes I'm talking about what the student sees and sometimes I'm talking about what the instructor is interacting with. So I'll have these like legends on the corner that you might want to keep your eye out on. So in terms of the students, these are the main technologies they're encountering in just about every single class. There's obviously other uh, packages that they're using and whatnot, but we're not gonna get into too much of the details of the content of the class. So the computing language is R, and they're using RStudio as the integrated development environment for um, interacting with R. Our Markdown is the R package that they use for literate programming. So every single artifact that they produce, be it a homework assignment project, is a reproducible document that has the pros and the code in it. Uh, we use Git for version control and GitHub for a variety of things, collaboration, publishing, and also course management. So in terms of the structure of the course, it's very similar to what Shane described. We have one organization per class, one repo per assignment per student or team, and this is how many roughly assignments there are. We have weekly labs that students are doing as teams, bi-weekly homework assignments that they complete as individuals, two take home exams that they do as individuals and a two phase project like a, a proposal and a final project that they complete as a team. Now imagine if you had 100 students and say maybe 30 to 35 teams in your class, these numbers really blow up. So you need a way to be able to manage the number of course repositories efficiently. I often get asked the question, but don't you end up with thousands of repos? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It turns out they don't charge us. So it doesn't matter that they are there, but it could matter if you're not accessing these repositories and doing your assessment in a programmatic way. Um, so from the instructor's perspective, there is one other technology that we're using. So that is an R package that myself and a couple collaborators have been working on um, called GH Class. And it is basically uh, tools for managing GitHub class organization accounts. Some of the aspects of it are very similar to the GitHub classroom that Shane described. So I will try to highlight things that are slightly different to kind of give you a glimpse of what else you could be doing just interacting with the GitHub API yourself. So before we get into what we're doing, I'd like to talk a little bit about how this uh, package works. And there are five design principles that we have evolved into <laughs> over the last kind of three or four years of working on it. So we have functions that are prefixed with either org, repo, team, GitHub, or local repo, so where you're dealing with your local files, to indicate what they operate on. Functions are vectorized over their parameters so that related uh, operations can be grouped with each other. So you can do batch creation of repositories, batch collection of repositories, so on and so forth. Um, they follow the Unix design philosophy where possible. So we have simple composable functions. So I will just uh, show you a few of the bigger uh, overarching functions that call on a bunch of the other ones, but underneath everything is a building block. And the functions are verbose to communicate what's happening because there's nothing as irritating as sitting there thinking your code is running and you're hitting an API, but turns out nothing actually is happening. So it does spit out a lot of information along the way, but you can quiet it down if you prefer. And actions are non-destructive and are backed by Git. And this was not necessarily true always, but we're working towards it. Uh, you don't want to accidentally overwrite students' work or delete their repositories. Just because you can access the API doesn't mean you should. So there are a handful of dangerous operations that actually throw warnings that I'll describe. Uh, show one of those as well. 
So I'm going to walk you through the whole game of what assigning uh, an assignment to the students and what they're from the instructor perspective and then from the student's perspective looks like as well. Um, the first thing that you do is create a course roster. I am a statistician by training. I think in rectangular tables. This is where what, how I organize my data. So this is what my data comes in. Each row is a student. And from the students, I collect their GitHub names. That's the most important thing that your students will need to create a GitHub account and then need to communicate that information back to you somehow. So we use a Google form for doing that. Um, there's no technology I can offer for chasing down students to get that information. Information. Um, then you write your assignment. So I would like to show you one of the assignments that um, is from earlier on in the class. The data set is bike crashes from North Carolina, where I was teaching before. You can see there's a lot of information, even embedded videos about how to set up, um, how to set things up, what a diff is. Even though we have made time for this in class, we actually have that all written down for the students. And then finally, we get to the exercises. And if you take a look at the exercises, you'll see there's a combination of data visualization, interpretation. So they actually have to write up their interpretations. And I even at the very bottom of it have some uh, recommendations for what their commit message should be. So there's a lot of hand holding going on, given that this is a much earlier uh, assignment in the class. Later on, we would probably get rid of much of that front matter where we describe how a repository works and how to commit and push and pull, only give the uh, questions that are about the data analysis itself, and probably not even uh, continue giving uh, suggestions about commit messages. Then we, as the instructor, create a repository with started, starter documents. So here I usually, um, you know, I will name it something informative. In addition to naming things like homework two, homework three, I also like giving some sort of a slug that will make me remember when somebody says in homework five what we're actually talking about. And we make these repositories, these starter repositories, private. And the reason why I do that is because when students come to the GitHub organization, I just want them to see the things that they have access to, not other repositories I am um, building for logistical purposes, even though there would be no harm in them seeing the starter uh, documents because they get a copy of them anyway. I find that it's actually confusing and they'll just like see the first repository with that name and grab its URL and think that's the one they need to be working with. So we try to minimize any confusion whatsoever. Um, this is what the repository looks like. There's not a whole lot in there. There's just that one RMD file, an R markdown file that actually has everything that the students need. So I'll show you in a second um, what is in there and how the students interact with it. But this at least sets the stage for them for where to get started. Then I actually go ahead and create the re repository. So the particular, I didn't want to open up any of my classes and put uh, screenshots here. So I made a, a fake kind of organization called GH Class Demo. And what we basically do is we're going to use this roster of six students to actually create repositories for them. So we're creating an assignment for each of the students. And when we run the code, as I said, it is verbose. It will tell you exactly what it's doing. But also, if something fails, you can figure out what it's doing. So we create repositories. We let the students into their respective repositories. Then we actually put the starter documents in there and then clean up after ourselves. This is what um, the repository for one of the students with the GitHub name GH class Anya looks like. So it's the same slug and then uh, suffix with uh, their username. They can see my commit to get started. And sometimes I have silly things in there, but you know they're there. And they can see me making mistakes as well. And this is where they basically get started in terms of GitHub. What comes next for them is actually, um, well, actually, usually what happens right here is I assign the homework, and then I realize I forgot to add something to this repository. Um, now I have hun perhaps 100 students in the class, and I have already created their repositories, but realized I forgot to add something. So you can actually, with another function, repo add file, add any files to it, and they will get added to the um, repositories with a given slug. So. Um, any repository that starts with homework three, I said, let's put this map in there as well. 
Um, and so what that looks like for the student is I actually construct a you know, reasonable sounding commit message to go with it, adding file and then the name of the file. So that gets added on to the student's repositories as well. This is not as bad. Usually what I make a mistake with is one of those starter documents. So th there it is possible between the time you start created these repositories and the time you realized you made a mistake that some students actually started working on it. So uh, you, if you are going to be overwriting um, anything that the students may actually have touched, uh, we used to not have this functionality here. It would just overwrite things, and students aren't happy about that usually, even though things are recoverable through Git. So now it actually has an option to overwrite uh, their document or not. And, if I, and it will message to you if it does overwrite for any students. So you can email them and let them know, hey, this is what happened. You may want to go back and make sure you pull in your changes. Um, when you do that, you can also give a particular uh, message, commit message, so it doesn't have to be a standard one. You can actually uh, describe what that uh, particular change is. All right, so now the student gets an email saying you have a homework assigned to you, and they go to the course organization, and these are the only repositories that are visible to that particular student. One of them is for an individual work, and the other one is for the team that they belong in. And this is what kind of their experience looks like. So I said they're coding in R, but they use the RStudio ID, and actually we use a um, kind of a cloud-based access for them. So they're not installing stuff on their computers. I think I would have difficulty with the audience that I'm dealing with, um, introductory students, that have no programming background whatsoever, potentially coming to class with variety of operating systems to actually have all of the software up and running, including Git. Um, I personally might have a trouble debugging some of the operating systems that they're working with. So we use a cloud-based access. So for the students, what's happening is they actually use RStudio Cloud to do their work, where they can start with a GitHub U, uh, repository URL, and what it'll do is it'll launch the RStudio IDE, ask them for their GitHub authentication, which um, I used to worry about things like saving uh, your personal access token and stuff. But actually, if you have browser-based access, you can just use a password manager and save it there, which is a lot something a lot, students are a lot more used to. And there they are starting with the same documents that we had started them with. And our Markdown document looks as such. Once they knit it, it's a reproducible document that actually has some placeholders for each of the exercises and stuff. And at that point, they're going to start working on their homework and writing in their um, answers to the problems. So in general, they're working in this editor. Uh, it's a notebook style editor for our Markdown. And they can view their work right here. And it outputs a Markdown file. The R Markdown file actually has, a, if you look at line five over there, a GitHub document output option. So it will render the images and write it. The output is kind of GitHub friendly Markdown. So you can just view the output on GitHub as well. Um, there is a Git pane, and this is the kind of the extent of students' Git exposure. They are doing things with Git and GitHub through this pane, and it takes care of 99% of what they need to do. Every once in a while, they will get themselves in a corner where the simple commit push pull isn't enough. And that's where I feel like that is, at that point, I jump in and actually help them with whatever issue they might be encountering. So here they can see the Git pane is always showing them Git status, basically, what files have changed. Um, they can see a diff of what they have changed. They can make a commit, and they can push it. And they should be able to see this, uh, the, their uh, changes reflected on GitHub. Once the deadline of the class comes, it's actually time to uh, give feedback and grades. So we're back to the instructor view now. And we use issues for this. Uh, for homework assignments where there is not an iterative aspect to it, where it's just going to be a you did the homework, and here's your feedback. We're going to move on to the next thing. We actually use uh, kind of one issue that lists all the potential things associated with that homework assignment. But for phased work, so for projects where they turn in first a um, 
proposal and then their actual project, I actually like opening an issue per thing, which is a lot more realistic to how you would uh, use issues and encourage students to close these issues with particular commits so that I can see this is where you address this particular issue. So in terms of the tooling uh, with the GH class package, I want to highlight a few things that I've found difficult to do using other technologies than we've implemented here. The first thing is, this is a word I learned recently, SITREP apparently stands for Situation Report, and I really like it. At any point I open my computer, I want something to give me everything is operating and is under control. So you need to have a token saved to be able to talk back and forth through the GitHub API. So you save that as an environment variable, and the package actually has a function for testing to make sure that everything is working properly. Uh, we can actually do team assignments, and we can change the teams around per assignment or keep them constant throughout the semester. The students don't need to remember which team they're in. We are actually creating the team assignments for them using the same function as before. And basically, if you look at the verbose output, what's happening is that multiple students are getting access to a single repository so that they can collaborate on it, depending on the team assignments that we had done and included in that initial roster spreadsheet that I showed you. This is what the teams look like. So I have two teams of three uh, members here. And um, if I go into any particular assignment, so you can say that it's uh, team two's assignment, we can see that only those are the people who are able to see this repository. Another thing that I am very excited about, because it's a new feature uh, in GitHub, are these draft pull requests. So uh, one of the things that I am a stickler for, and I think people should be a stickler for, but can be annoying to give feedback about, is style of code. So if you follow a particular style, it is not fun to have to write issues where you're saying things like, please put white spaces around your equation signs. Um, and it can get quite tedious. So with a repo style function, what we're basically doing is that we create a branch from the student's repository, run a styler code on it, and then leave it as what is called a uh, kind of a draft pull request. So the student gets a notification that looks something like this. And the, you can see that the student is notified because we have tagged them in this issue. And it says, here's some information about the style guide that we're using. And they know to click on this commit. And they can actually see all the things we're suggesting they change, but they can't merge this pull request. This allows me to not have to talk about pull requests, which is kind of nice, because that's not in my curriculum. And number two, I don't want them to just say, all right, let's do this and let's move on. I actually want them to go through this uh, because we have points allocated to that. Um, other things that I make mistakes around, sometimes I batch create repositories and then I realize I made something completely stupid here. So we can de batch delete repositories as well. So here I'm deleting any repository that starts with the uh, prefix homework three and C by crash. Um, now this could be problematic. I could be deleting student work. So for things where your actions could actually have potentially really harmful effects for the students, the functions in the package will ask you, do you really want to do this? And only if you say yes, it'll go ahead and delete them. So it allows you to you know, just check yourself once. What else is coming? Uh, well, there are two things that I am most kind of interested in and concerned with, and those are both around scalability. Um, so one thing is, potential automation, uh, kind of the uh, type of stuff that Shane described in terms of giving automated feedback. We used to have uh, functions in this package that relied on worker for doing some automated checks and giving feedback to students. Uh, we have pulled these functions out of the package into their own package. I'll call it like a conscious uncoupling at this point. <laughs> um, the worker API has been a little bit unstable. They're not necessarily doing what, um, things have gone downhill over the last year, it seems like. So I think we're giving up on that. Travis is a possibility, so I would definitely want to look at what Chan's been working on and see, could that be it? Another thing is Azure Pipelines could be another one. But I am dreaming of GitHub Actions working for us. Um, one of my goals is whatever of this stuff is happening in the background, I don't need my particular students in the Intra Data Science class to learn the names of these. I want this thing, I want these to happen in the background, and I want them to message to students, 
but I don't really need them to be learning one other technology. So I'm hoping that we can actually do this automated feedback thing um, through not having to go through another third party provider. So I'm looking, I'm excited to see what might come of GitHub Actions. But to be perfectly honest, this is not my expertise area. I think a lot of you in this room have a lot more experience doing automated testing um, than I do. And so what I want to actually focus my attention on is another way of both scaling up and letting students learn from each other, which is peer review. A lot of the exercises my students are working on are not just about the code, but also the interpretations. I could write tests that check to see if the bounds of a confidence interval are correct. That is easy enough, and there's tooling out there to let me check that. But how do you actually assess that a student has appropriately interpreted a confidence interval in the context of a particular data analysis question? There aren't as good automated tools for that, and humans are often do a better job giving feedback, and also by giving feedback to each other, students learn from each other. So what we're working on is new functionality for the package where once the students finish um, an assignment, we actually randomly assign them to other students as reviewers, so we're moving the files using the GitHub API and stripping out the YAMLs of these files so things can be remained anonymous and stripping out any sort of commit history. And then once the reviewers are done, we get the review back to the students, we collect the scores these students have given, and then we also allow the students to rate the reviewer just very minorly saying, this was very helpful, I wish you had been more kind of detailed, so on and so forth. So the reviewers realize that um, you know, their words are being heard. So this is functionality that's in the pipeline that I'm working with um, a student on over the summer. So my acknowledgments are Colin Rundell, the last name is not a, um, you know, a, a happenstance. Writing software with your significant other is a whole other thing we can talk about elsewhere. Um, but so this, a lot of this package it was born from random bash scripts Colin had laying around and we've been working uh, with it in the, within the R ecosystem. And Therese Anders is the student I'm working with over the summer in terms of all of the peer review functionality. And this is where my slides are. And if you want to learn more about the package, that's the URL. And I'm happy to answer any questions over the break.